My name is Tim Wong, and I'm the head of school here at Trinity Christian High School. Growing healthy minds is so important to us because we really do believe how a person thinks can really transform the way that they live. You know, one thing that we love doing here uh, at Trinity is an opportunity for them to really see what's, what's happening in the world around them. How do you actually take that all in and how do you um, wrestle with that uh, biblically, uh, with God's love and His truth? And uh, I think um, being able to do that and think um, not only um, about those issues, but also with a Christ-like heart. Uh, to think empathetically. Even though you know we work with high schoolers every day, um, this is something that is a continuous process. Like one of the biggest things that we look for for our staff and uh, even for myself is that we're always learning. Uh, we're always, the best teachers are the best students. Uh, so you always wanna continue to exercise that muscle and continue to grow your mind. Some of our best times that we have with our students is not even so much in class. You know, the curriculum only can cover so many things. Uh, it's actually in the hallways or it's in the conversations uh, at a game or something like that. And students bring up issues that are just really is on their heart or they heard about uh, or their friend told them about or it's just somehow, somehow it's just like, you know, going through social media and really being able to go in depth about those things. And during those times, we find that the best method is really asking deeper questions and uh, really helping them not what to think, but really how to think. And I think that's really very important in their own personal growth, and it actually helps us grow as well. It's kind of neat. Tim Wong and his family actually go to church here at Shoreline, and a number of the teachers and students at, at Trinity Christian go to Shoreline. And so Shoreline Church supports Christian education. And Shoreline Church also supports public education. We are very engaged in partnering with and helping the local schools in our community in any way that we can. And also, Shoreline Church supports homeschooling. There's two large homeschooling groups that actually meet here on our campus a couple times during the week, and we don't charge them anything for that. He said, well, Shoreline, make up your mind. Do you support Christian schooling or public schooling or homeschooling? What's the answer? Oh, the answer is yes, all of them, right? We support learning and education. We're talking today about growing your mind. A mind that will honor God, a mind that will glorify God. Having a healthy, growing mind. You know, when Jesus walked on this earth, he had lots of questions that were asked of him by lots of different people for lots of different reasons. But one of the most important questions that anybody asked Jesus was this. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the greatest commandment in all that God has given, all that God had set up to that time in history? What is the greatest commandment? And the answer is this. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Jesus said, of all things, love God. But we sometimes miss, as we hear, love God with your heart, love God with your soul, but he says, love God with your mind. Do you understand that, that how we think, how we shape our minds, what we let come into our minds, and what, it shapes who we are, who we become, how we act, what we do. And so we're called to love God. And that love is not a passive love. That's an active, committed love. Say, so I want to love God with my mind. Did you know that God really cares about our minds? I think a lot of people don't realize how much God cares about our minds. So there's all kinds of scriptures that address this topic. I'm going to read a few. I want you to notice, and you can follow along. The first one's going to be found in Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 8. But I want you to notice how our minds come up again and again. And notice what God is saying about our minds, about watching our minds, guarding our minds, growing our minds. God cares about this. It's, it's through his word. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 7. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. There's a certain orientation of our thinking towards fleshly things, and that impacts our minds. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit of God, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Two different sets of things to be thinking about, to be focused on. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Which do you prefer? <laughs> Man, I prefer life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
Boy, the Apostle Paul is so clear in saying, we can focus our minds on things that are kind of more fleshly, earthly, worldly. It doesn't mean that everything in the world is bad. That's not the point at all. But there's certain things that just aren't what God wants our minds to be focused on. And we can focus on those things and it will impact us. Or we can focus on our, th- our minds on things of the Spirit and the things of God. And that will shape who we become. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33 says this. Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. God said, I'm gonna take my word, my truth, and I'm gonna write it on their minds. It's gonna shape who they become. Look at me at Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, there's this powerful exhortation. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Make it new. Renew your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God has a plan. God has a way. God has a will. And how we think powerfully impacts that. Look at me at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, there's God's peace again, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you see how often the heart and the mind come up together? God is concerned about our minds the world of our thoughts, what we put into our minds, what we fill our minds with, what we orientate our minds uh, toward, because that will impact what we say and what we do and how we think and how we impact the people around us. It'll impact how we worship God and live for God. Our minds are so critical and so important, and there's so many things that can come against thinking the way we should think and having minds that are focused on the things of God. I want to take time this morning to give some words of encouragement. I'm going to share seven different ideas or thoughts around really kind of, kind of thinking about our minds and trying to orient, orient them towards God and grow them and develop them in a way that will please him. My hope and prayer is that one or two of these will really resonate for you and you'll say, oh, that's, that's something for me. I can start to live that out today. I can start to see my life changed in the way I think and how my mind works. So number one, if you're a note taker, there's a space in your bulletin to write these things down. Number one, flood your mind with heavenly truth and memorize it. Flood your mind with heavenly truth. This is the Bible. It's God's word. Now, watch closely. Here's what I encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to get God's word on your mind. So if you'll just carry your Bible around like this for like an hour or two, what happens is it's kind of like osmosis. All the words and the truth will just sink into your mind and you'll know scripture and it'll be easy, right? Right? Not quite that easy. This, this is a metaphor. This is a picture. This is silly. But the, uh, you get the idea, right? To, to have the word of God on your mind, in your mind, shaping your thinking. So, so, so that when you walk through life, God's word guides you. When you're heading down the wrong path, God's word nudges you back on the path again by the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe God can put something on our heart anytime he wants to. And God can put thoughts in our mind if he wants to. But I believe most of the biblical guidance we're going to get is because we've read this book, we've studied this book, we've memorized this book, we're meditating on this book. Uh, Sherry and I uh, actually like to, uh, we, in, our, in our garage, we've got a little place we exercise, and against the wall where we exercise, there's all these different Bible passages stuck up there. And I'll put some up there, she'll put some up there. And they're just passages over the last six months, year or so, that Sherry and I have been working on, committing to memory, to think about, and maybe not even totally memorize like I can say it, but get the thought and the idea just deep in my mind. And for Sherry to have the scriptures on her mind being guarded by God's word. I, I want to challenge you. If you want to have a mind that is a strong mind and a clear thinking mind, immerse yourself in the scriptures. First thing every morning, right before you go to bed at night, at your lunch break, I, I, there's not an exact right time. I would suggest when your mind is the sharpest, give that time to God. If you say, man, I'm sharp in the evenings, then, then spend some time and open the Bible. If you say, I don't know where to start. Every week at Shoreline, we have a daily reading guide for the whole week to get you ready for the next week's sermon. It's on the website, it's in your bulletin. It's that important to us that we actually plan those readings to get you ready for next week's sermon. So I don't know where to start, start there. 
that get God's word in your heart and your mind. And as you do that, it guides your life. I remember one profound experience I had. This was years ago. I was walking out of a credit union, and I had kind of gone up, got up in line, and I got to be my turn. And while I was up there with a teller, and there's only one teller, there's only one booth that opened, I didn't realize I was kind of talking and visiting with a teller. I didn't realize there was a big line forming behind me. So somebody in the line was kind of irritated at me. So when I finished my banking and I turned around and was walking out, I walked by this guy and he just made a comment to me. He said something kind of profane and made a comment to me that was quite rude and mean-spirited. So I'm walking by him and as he says this, I, I just sort of paused. And I was going to turn towards him and say, excuse me? You talking to me? I was going to say, you're, you're ta- I said, you're talking to me? You know? And I was going to just, just engage in a little conversation. You know what I'm saying? Just have a little chat, right? So anyways, I'm, I'm walking out after I've done my banking. He makes this comment to me, and I just paused, and this is what went through my mind. The anger of a fool is known at once, but a wise person ignores an insult. I had committed that to memory from the book of Proverbs, and God brought it to my mind. So, so in real time, I finished my banking. I'm walking out. He makes the comment. I pause. I'm about to engage. The word of God says the anger of a fool is known at once, but a wise person ignores an insult, and I kept on walking. And I was a wise person for once. You know, I, but, but God, just taking God's word and putting it in my, in my mind and in my soul was powerful for me. That changed my behavior. That changed my interaction. Psalm 119, verses 11 and 15 say this. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I think about your ways. I think about your truths. I turn them over in my mind. I want to challenge you to be involved in personal Bible reading. To get involved in a Bible study here at Showing. We have men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies. We have growth groups. We have precept upon precept. We have classes. We have all kinds of ways to grow in God's word here in community. Uh, I challenge you to pick a passage and commit it to memory. You say, well, that's... That's for kids in Awana. That's for little kids on Wednesday nights. They do Bible memory and they get little badges. Do I get a badge if I learn a verse? No, you don't. But you get God's word in your mind. So I want to challenge you to pick a passage and commit it to memory. And let that shape your mind and your thinking. Number two, shut off or limit the input of garbage. If you're a note taker, write down the word input and garbage. Shut off, shut off or limit the input of garbage. Just be careful with what's coming into your mind. Be careful about the things that are impacting your thinking. There's people that sit and watch depressing shows or read depressing books or 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 look at depressing magazines or depressing websites all day long and they're like, I don't know why I'm so depressed. So I I got an idea, you know? There's people that that, that bring so many things that are just kind of contentious and violent and one-sided with no sense of peaceable interaction but just antagonism and conflict. I don't know why I'm so wound up. It's like, well, it might be all the stuff you're feeding into your mind. So tune into that and pay attention to that and be aware of that. If I ran out of gas and somebody pulled over and said, hey, I I got some gas and you need some gas for your car. And I said, unleaded, unleaded, great. If it's diesel, that's a problem. But that would be helpful. I could drive to the gas station and fill up my tank. But if I ran out of gas and somebody pulled pulled over and said, hey, listen, listen, let me help you out. I've got this wonderful maple syrup. It is so delicious. It is so tasty. Natural maple syrup. Just pour some in your tank and then drive to the closest gas station. I'm not going to do it. It's not going to just not only not work, it's going to gum up the whole system. I think sometimes we're pouring stuff into our minds, gumming up the whole system, and we either don't recognize it or don't think enough about it to actually think, is this really good for me? You know, and there's, there's so many options. It used to be you know, a, couple chat, chat, uh, a couple channels on TV and a few magazines. Now it's just like endless content. And a lot of it may be wonderful and helpful. Discern that. But a lot of it might be like pouring syrup in your gas tank. And you can't figure out why your, your brain feels frazzled or you feel so wound up or why you feel... You know, and you say, well, what are you feeding into your mind? If you're a note taker, write down these four questions. I think this will be helpful for you. Ask these questions as you're thinking about what am I going to put in my mind through what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what I'm viewing, whatever it is. What am I putting into my mind? Number one, does it edify? Does it edify? The word edify means make me better. Does it edify me? Does it make me better? My wife will sometimes say when I'm watching something, is that really edifying? And I'm like, don't ask, you know. Um, but but, no, but, I'm, I'm, but, she, but she's, it's, a, it's the right question. And she grew up in a home with almost like no media stuff at all. And, so, and, and, I, and I said this last week, I'm not anti-media, but we have to be careful what we're kind of pouring into our minds. Does it edify? Does it make me think better, feel better? Does it make me a better person? Second question, does it help me love God 
and love people more. She said, those are the two most important things. Love God, love people. Does what I'm pouring into my mind help me love God and love people more effectively? Next question. Does it really refresh me? Does it really refresh me? This is, this is kind of my own question. Because I'll be like, after a long day of work, I'll be like, I'm just going to sit down and watch some sports. I'm just going to sit down and just kind of go brain dead for a half an hour, an hour, and just in front of the TV. And, I, and that, that's what I'll do for refreshment. The problem is, at the end of that time, if I stop and say, do I feel more refreshed? A lot of times I don't. So I'm telling myself I'm doing this for refreshment, but it's not actually refreshing me. So ask yourself, if I'm doing something, if I'm going to kind of go brain dead for a while, is it actually something that's going to bring the desired result of refreshment? And then number four, does it strengthen the muscle of my mind? Is, this, is what I'm going to read, what I'm going to view, what I'm going to kind of put in my mind right now, this interaction, is it going to strengthen the muscle of my mind? What I find is a lot of the, inter- we've, got, we've just got endless entertainment available. And is that true? I mean, there's no end to the entertainment you can have at the push of a button. And, and so the, the question becomes, does it strengthen the muscle of my mind? Does what I'm, what I'm viewing or what I'm kind of putting into my mind, is it just sort of easy, blah, or does it actually challenge me to think? And I don't think we challenge ourselves to think deeply a lot in those moments where we just kind of take the easy route of easy entertainment. And here's something that has struck me. I don't know if this has struck you, but it, there's so many shows now that are out there that there's not one single redeeming character. Not one person in the entire show that you would say, I want my granddaughter to be just like her. I want my grandson to grow up like him. I want my son or daughter to be just like that. Almost every character can be just so angry and nasty and negative and gossipy. And the whole show is built around, there's not like one, you know, who's the hero? Who's the good person? Who's the one go, oh, let's be like that person. And there's not shows where that's not even there. Ask yourself, is this what I want to be feeding into my mind? Because it will impact how I live my life. Number three, think broadly while you stand firmly. Think broadly while you stand firmly. I would put it this way. Know what you believe and believe it with conviction, but graciously listen to other people who you disagree with. Read people you disagree with. I try to, I try to regularly watch news from the left, from the right, and from the center. It's hard to, the hardest one to find is the center. It's hard to find anybody who's kind of not really skewing one way or the other. I try to actually get this, hear the same news from various perspectives. I know where I stand, but I want to know how other people are thinking. I want to understand how they come at the world. And there's something extremely valuable about that. One of my most profound experiences uh, of, of really learning to listen to a person who was different than me was I was on an airplane. I was supposed to be going to one country, hit an ice storm uh, connecting through Chicago, and got, got, they put me on the wrong plane going to the wrong country that they would connect me and try to eventually get me to the right country. So I was not in a great mood anyways. It's the middle of the night. I'm tired. And this young woman comes down the aisle, sits next to me, and she wants to chat. And she introduces herself. Her name is Ancha. And she, she, says, she says, I am an atheistic, humanistic, communist. <laughs> and she ran a, and she, I found out she ran a camp in former East Germany to keep young people from becoming Christians. Atheist? I, so I'd never met an atheistic, communistic humanist who ran a camp to keep people from becoming Christians. But this is what she was about. For about two hours, I just asked her questions. I, I, was, fasc- I was truly fascinated by her. I'd never met anybody quite... She was so excited about her atheism and so excited about her humanism. And so I kept saying, well, tell me what you mean by humanist. Tell me what you mean by... And I just asked questions. And I learned a lot about her. As she was telling me about her view of humanism, she said, I believe that every single human being is valuable and matters. The outcasts, the marginalized, the hurting, they should matter as much as anybody else. And I said to her, can I tell you who you're sounding like when you talk like that? She says, who? I said, you sound like Jesus. She said, I do not. I said, no. I said, actually, actually you do. Uh, I, said, I said, have you ever read the Bible? Have you read the story of Jesus? She says, well, no. She's an atheist who's never even looked at the Bible. I said, well, my Bible's in my suitcase above. Can I get it? And can I, sh- can we, I want you to read what Jesus said. She said, sure, would you? Got my Bible down. We had about a two-hour Bible study. And I showed her how Jesus loved the marginalized and loved the broken and loved the outcast and loved the people who were in the depths of brokenness and reached out to them. We had an amazing conversation. At the end of the, end of the trip, she gave me her contact information. She said, if you and your wife and your sons are ever in Berlin, please come stay with me. I said, I bet you when you got on this plane, you never thought you'd be inviting a pastor to come to your home, did you? <laughs> she said, I didn't. Now, in that conversation, I didn't agree with her worldview on a lot of things. But I came to love her and care about her 
and believed that maybe she wasn't that far from the kingdom of God. Amen. And we had a wonderful time talking together. Can we challenge ourselves to think broadly, understand different perspectives, but to stand firmly? You can know where you stand. You can know what you believe. You can hold to it with unwavering confidence and boldness and still listen to others and read different perspectives and gain different outlook and understand how other people think so you can have meaningful conversations with real people. My dad and my mom, uh, for years, uh, we would disagree on lots of things. Now my mom's passed with my dad. We disagree on lots of stuff, but we love each other. I love the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 when he's on, in Mar, on Mars Hill in Athens. And, he, and the Apostle Paul is talking to the philosophers of the day. And he has a very different worldview than them, but there's this temple that they've set up for the unknown God in case they missed some in their pantheon, in case they missed one God. They said, here's one for the unknown God. And he says, can I tell you about the unknown God? And he begins to share the story of the gospel. And while he's doing it, listen to this, he quotes their philosophers and their poets to them. He read broadly, he thought broadly, he knew where he stood but he also knew where they stood. There's something powerful about it and that grows our minds. Number four, play good games. Um, I should, mentioned games last week, but I, I mean this. Pick games where you, where, play games with people in the same room face to face that are fun, that are funny, that make you think. My brother Jason has six children and they play games on a daily basis with their kids and their kids are incredibly smart. There's a couple of these math and like number games I won't play with my eight-year-old niece because uh, she'll just crush me like a bug. Because, because, but they, but they, they learn while they play. When my boys were growing up, I would make up games and just, just things to get us thinking and talking. And so find games that are fun. We, we had a game growing up when I was a kid called Masterpiece where you were buying art and you had all these pictures of the great masterpieces through history. Find games that you can do with your children, with your friends that get, cause you to think. Number five, know your doctrine. Know what you believe. Don't be a Christian who, who responds to Christian doctrine like people respond to prompts on their computer. Uh, you, know, here, you need to sign this and read these 87 pages before you agree. Just go click, box, agree, move on. You know, we don't even read it. When it comes to our belief as Christians, know what you believe. On our website, Sherlin's website, we've got a list of all our, our core doctrine. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world who gave himself on the cross and rose again for the price for our sins. Know what you believe. I'm leading a class today at 1 o'clock called a new, new members class. And if you want to know about membership at Shoreland, you don't have to join, but if you want to know about it, we're going to go through all of our core beliefs and talk about them together. Know what you believe, and then listen closely. If you think you know what you believe as a Christian, if you say, well, I believe that Christ is the Savior, he died on the cross and rose again, fantastic. But what if somebody asked you this profound question? Why? He said, I believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why? If your answer is this, because that's what the pastor told me. <laughs> if your answer is, well, that's what my parents told me. That's not going to hold up in our world. If your children's answer is, that's what my parents said, or that's what I heard in Sunday, why? Be able to open this book. Be able to explain your faith graciously, kindly, but thoughtfully, mindfully, thinking about what it means. No, and you say, well, you might not believe the Bible, but I do, and here's what the Bible teaches, and know what the Word says. Know logically why you believe what you believe so you can stand strong on it. I love how the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy writes these words to Timothy, this young pastor. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit. That's your doctrine, what you believe. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Know what you believe. Be able to articulate your faith and hold strong to your faith. Some of you, your, your mental growth needs to be, I need to understand why I believe what I believe and dig into that. On our website where it lists our doctrines, there's also a whole series of Bible passages as to why we believe that. Dig into those, study those, learn from those. Number six, Exercise logic. We're in a world where logic is in many ways kind of thrown out the window. This is the kind of language that, that really betrays a walking away from logic. Well, you know, that's your truth. Well, you have your truth. I have my truth. There's not your truth, my truth, his truth, her truth. There's truth. Truth is truth. And, and some of you even, as I said, some of you are probably like, oh, wait a minute, don't say that. That seems so closed-minded. No, that's just logical. I'll give you an example. When it comes to, to belief in God, there's three, I'll give you three, there's many kinds of religious systems. I'll give you three simple religious systems. Atheism. Atheism believes there is no God. Theism. 
we are theists as Christians, believes there is one God. And polytheism believes there's many gods. In some cases, you know, a handful of gods. In some cases, thousands and thousands of gods. So you have one belief system that says there's no God, one belief system, belief system that says there's one God, and one system that says there's many gods. Can all three of these be equally true at the same time? No. Okay, see, so that was a very meager response. <laughs> um, the answer is absolutely not. If an atheist is right and there is no God, then a theist is wrong when they say there's a God. Because if an atheist is right, the theist has to be wrong. If a theist, if there is truly one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, if that's true, then an atheist is wrong and a polytheist is wrong. And some people say, well, that's in the world of religion. We can all have different religious beliefs and they're equally true. Well, they, they might be equally meaningful to people, but they're not equally true. Truth is truth. And logic says, if one thing is true, then there's other things that are not true. And, and people say struggle with that. I'm going to challenge you to grapple with thinking about the fact that, uh, that I need to be logically consistent in how I think. And we, I think we have people growing up in our world today who don't think the, about the logical implications of what they say, and we need to learn to think logically. One more thought. Remove distractions and avoid fragmentation so you can think deeply. Remove distractions, avoid fragmentation of your mind, of your thinking, and think deeply. Romans 12, 2 says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Renew your mind, grow your mind, but this is gonna take time. It's gonna take focus. It's gonna take effort. And what's happening in our world now today is that there's so much fragmentation of just distractions, constant distractions. People in our generation say, oh, I'm great at multitasking. I can do five things really well at the same time. Almost every study shows that's really not true. We're just doing lots of things poorly. And so I want to challenge you to look and say, God, how can I just get my mind to think in a focused way? I, I actually read a book a while back called Deep Work by a guy named Cal Newport, smart guy. He has two PhDs, uh, both from MIT. And now... Cal Newport does not come from the same place I do theologically, but I read books from people who don't think just the way I think. I can learn from them also. And so in this whole book, he talks about how, how all of our technology, I'm preaching right now from an iPad. I'm not anti-technology. But, but he talks about the fact that if we have phones beeping and buzzing and textings co coming in all the time and our watches now are telling us, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, we may get to the point where we never focus on anything more than a minute or two or three minutes. And it's literally rerouting the neural pathways of our brains. We have people whose brains are being rewired where they simply cannot focus. So I actually took some lessons from his book, and I'm, I'm turning my technology off at a certain point in the evening. I'm not turning my phone on. I put it on airport, airport, uh, airplane mode when, uh, in the evening, and in the morning when I wake up, until I've spent time in God's Word, until I've exercised, I don't turn the airplane mode off. So I can have my alarm for my phone, but I don't get any texts, any emails. Well, how can I survive if I can't respond to everybody immediately? I've been doing this for like a year. I'm just fine. As a matter of fact, I'm better off. I can focus on my wife. I can focus on my family. In my office, I have a space called a deep work space where if people want to meet with me. There's a little charger unit outside. And I say, leave your phone there. And if, you ever, if your watch brings messages, take it off and put it there too. And come in and have a human face-to-face -face conversation with me. And if somebody says, oh, I can't leave my phone. Is your, are you going to have a baby? Are you, is there an emergency? Well, no. I said, then it stays out there or we don't meet. Because I'm going to have a conversation with another human being. And I'm gonna, we're going to be focused on each other. And I take my phone and my stuff and I leave it out there too. And I'm seeing some of my staff around. Isn't this true? We got it, and, there's a and then they leave the office, forget their phone. And they have to come back and find it later. But, but, but the point is this. We have to make a decision to be careful that we're not fragmenting our minds all the time. I would suggest that you have times where you just go tech-free. This is fascinating. Article in the New York Times. The chief technology officer at eBay sends his children to a nine-classroom school. So do employees of Silicon Valley giants like Google, Apple, Yahoo, and Hewitt Packard. But the school's chief teaching tools are anything but high-tech. Pens and paper, knitting needles, and occasionally mud... Not a computer is found, no screens at all. They are not allowed in the classroom, and the school even frowns on their use at home. People who are making these devices are sending their kids to schools where they're not allowed. One parent, Mr. Eagle, knows a bit about technology. He holds a computer science degree from Dartmouth. He works as an executive communications at Google, but he says his fifth, fifth grade daughter doesn't know how to use Google. 
because she's not been exposed to it yet. And his eighth grade son is just learning. This is, this is an executive of communications at Google, and he doesn't let his children use those. He, now, he says, now, there's a time where their minds will be ready for this, but not, so, so, so a, a two-year-old who were, were thrilled that they can navigate the world of technology, we, is, is that always the best thing? Now, again, I, I'm preaching from an iPad. I love technology, but we can limit things. We can put boundaries, and here's the key. If you want to have a healthy mind, have times where it's not fragmented with other stuff coming in. Just, just take a day off someday, a tech day off. And if you have your phone, if you have a, you know, your phone comes through your watch, don't, don't wear that watch. Go, go away for like 10 hours without your phone, without, with no connection. This is how people have lived for all of history <laughs> until just recently. And you might just be like, this is really cool. This is neat. I can just kind of, you know. But, but train your mind to have to- quiet time to think. And, and here's the bottom line. God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So God, this is our prayer. This is our prayer. That you would help take charge of our minds. If we're flooding junk in, we would cut off the floodgates. We would ask good questions about what we're doing and what we're viewing and what we're reading and, and what we're surfing for and scanning. And, and Lord, that we would really learn to, sh- to glorify you in every part of our lives, to love you well with all of who we are, including our minds. And I pray that each person here will leave here today with one or two ideas that will propel them forward. I pray that everyone here will leave with a greater commitment to fill their minds with your word. But Lord, set our minds aside for your glory. Help us think well. If we need to purge some junk, Lord, by your spirit, we need to purge it out. Help us cut off the source of junk. And help us honor you with all that we are. 